Okay, so good morning again. So we'll be talking about multi-inflammatory syndrome in children, the Philippine experience. So this will be the outline of my lecture, the introduction, local epidemiology of acute COVID-19 in the Philippines, profile of missing cases from two tertiary hospitals, and the risk factor and prevention of MISI. So this is the history of MISI. It was first recognized in April of 2020 in the United Kingdom when some pediatric intensivists noted several critically ill children developing hyperinflammatory syndrome, um, very similar to Kawasaki disease, but these children had, um, had evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection. So they reported this to, the, to their society. It's called the Royal College of Pediatrician and Child Health. And they termed this as Pediatric Inflammatory Multisystem Syndrome Temporarily Associated with SARS-CoV-2. So this was the name given to Miss C in the United Kingdom. Okay. So after a month, um, the US CDC and the WHO also released case definitions of Miss C. And subsequently, on the next four months, um, um, doctors, uh, scientists were already exchanging data on the clinical presentation and the laboratory features of these Miss C cases. So these are the existing case definitions of multi-system inflammatory syndromes um, depending on the international organization. So we have the um, definition from the RCPCH of UK, the USCDC, and the WHO. So initially, it was primarily for children, but later on, the USCDC also included case definition for adults as well, and they call it as Miss A. Okay? So as you see here, um, for age and the duration of fever, it's, it, it varies depending on what organization you will follow. All of them agreed that there should be evidence of inflammation, and this is represented by your inflammatory markers such as CRP, ESR, interleukin-6, ferritin, and the like. For hospitalization, USC, the USCDC requires um, hospitalization, while the WHO um, um, does not need to be hospitalized because some missing some mis cases are generally mild and can be managed um, at home by supportive treatment. Um, all of them agreed that there, there should be an organ involvement, but it depends. Some would say one, um, the CDC and the WHO requires at least two organ involvement. When it comes to Miss A, the organ involvement should be extra pulmonary. So for the organ systems involved, they can be gastrointestinal, dermatologic, uh, neurologic, hematologic, and the like. They all agreed that, that, that there should be no other plausible diagnosis explaining the disease. And for the CDC and WHO, um, there should be proof of SARS-CoV-2 infection, whether it's PCR, antigen, or serologic testing. But in case there's no available test, uh, a history of exposure will suffice. So until now, the pathophysiology of Miss C is unknown. There is some form of abnormal immune response to the virus. The molecular mechanisms that lead to hyperinflation is still largely unknown. And it appears to be a consequence of massive release of inflammatory mediators with exaggerated activation of the immune system like a cytokine storm. So now we go to the epidemio epi epidemiology of acute COVID cases in the Philippines. So the first uh, COVID case was reported um, last February 2020. And uh, the graph here shows you the um, COVID cases from February 2020 until October of 2022. And these cases is based on the PCR results. So this is underreported because those who undergo rapid antigen testing or those tests being done at home are not included in in the number of cases. And um, if you remember in 2020, 2021, uh, we were still on lockdowns. There were several restrictive measures and people uh, frequently would undergo testing. So gusto gusto pa nilang magpa-test. But if you notice this, this year, because of the relaxation of measures, less and less people are being swapped or are being tested unless they are hospitalized. 
Also in this graph, you will see here the different waves or the different peaks or surges of, of, um, of um, COVID infections. And the, the different peaks or surges of COVID infection corresponds to the different um, variants of COVID that have evolved for the past two years. So if you remember, um, during the first quarter of 2021, um, there was an increase in cases, and that was secondary to the alpha, beta, and gamma variants. In the middle of last year, we have, again, another increase more than the first quarter, and that was due to the delta variant. And um, early this year, in January 2022, if you will notice, a very sharp increase in the number of cases, and that corresponded to the Omicron surge. And for the rest of the year, we've been dealing with the different Omicron subvariants. As for the age, um, children are least affected. Again, this may be underreported because not all children are being tested. Mothers would say that it is, um, they don't want to hurt their child, so they would rather not test the child anyway. Um, the child are the child the children have mild symptoms so supportive treatment is given so they won't have the child uh, being tested but the good news is if you look at the deaths children are um, they have the lowest number of deaths among the age group this is the national covid 19 vaccination dashboard in the philippines and it is estimated that, appro that approximately 70 percent uh, of the population has received at least one dose of the COVID vaccine represented by the, by the blue graph. But looking at closely, there's still a big gap between the first dose and the second dose of the vaccine. And furthermore, you will see here uh, the very slow uptake of the booster vaccine represented by your red graph. So teenagers 12 to 17 years old were approved to be given the COVID vaccine last year in October of 2021. And furthermore, this year, five to 11 years old were allowed to be given the COVID vaccine last January of 2022. So now I'll be sharing with you the MISI cases that we've had uh, in two tertiary centers where I work, that's St. Luke's Medical Center, Quezon City, and the one at Bonifacio Global City. So both hospitals are accredited by the Joint Commission International Accreditation. So from January 2021 to September 2022, these are the number of COVID-related admissions in children. So there was a total of 269, 218 of which were acute COVID cases, and there were, there were 51 missy cases, accounting for 18% of the admissions. The mean age is three years old. The median age is two. So this is in contrast to international data that says that uh, missy is usually seen in older children. And if you look at the age distribution by percentage, majority of missy cases were from the preschool age group. So the two to six years old, followed by the toddler age group and the school age group. Majority are males. The total number of MISI cases from last year to September of 2022 is 51. I included here the number of Kawasaki disease patients because we also noted an increase in the number of Kawasaki disease. And um, as clinicians, we all know that there's really an overlap of the clinical manifestations of MIS-C and Kawasaki disease. If you um, compare the number of cases from January to September this year to that of last year, there was a significant increase of 375% increase in the number of MIS-C cases. While in Kawasaki disease, there was also a significant increase of at least 189%. So again, I'm showing you the, the waves and the surges of COVID cases in our country that corresponded to the uh, COVID variants. And the reason why I'm showing this is in relation to Miss C, we usually see Miss C cases around six four weeks after an acute COVID infection. 
And it is said that this four to six week lag corresponds to the acquiring of immunity of that person, suggesting that Miss C is really a post-infectious complication of uh, COVID instead of an acute infection. So these are the number of cases uh, per month in 2021. So these are the MISC cases that we've seen. And you will notice that we had a, uh, an increase in cases in May, and that was during the alpha and beta variants, and, un and an increase in the number of cases in October um, after the Delta variant surge. Now I added here the Kawasaki disease cases, and you also see here uh, the peak number of cases following the MISC cases. This is the number of MISC cases for 2022. And you will see here a very high number of MISC cases in February. Remember, we had the Omicron surge in January. So in February, we had the MISC cases. So there was a, a four-week uh, lag before uh, the appearance of the MISC cases. Then there was a lull between March to June, so uh, very few cases. And then in August, we're now seeing again an upward trend of MISC cases. If we add again the Kawasaki disease cases, we also, again, the peak number of Kawasaki cases also follows that of MISC cases. When it comes to symptoma symptomatology, fever is the most common symptom. Among the mucocutaneous symptoms, rash is the most prominent. Um, gastrointestinal symptoms are very prominent in MIS-C, among which diarrhea is the most prominent symptom. We still have quite a number who developed respiratory symptoms, a few with neurologic symptoms like headache, and very, very few presenting with cervical lymph adenopathy, genitourinary symptom, edema of hands and feet, and pallor. Just like in the international data, majority of our MISI cases have no underlying illness, meaning these are children who, who, who are healthy and they were clinically well previously. Okay? Only 24% had underlying illness. And these were the underlying illness of those patients. Uh, the two cases above were our mortalities. So we had two mortalities. Both of them had genetic abnormalities at birth. The one is cocaine syndrome, and the second one was congenital microcephaly. We usually ask history of exposure to COVID um, infection for the past six weeks, and um, almost half denied any exposure to COVID infection. When we asked if there was history of past infection of COVID six weeks prior, more than half um, also denied that there was any infection with COVID six weeks prior. But if you look at the serologic test, so except for one, we did serologic test to 50, uh, to 50 MIS-C cases. You see here that 92% of those tested was positive for IgG, indicating a past infection. So probably those, those children who, had, who denied past infection or who had no uh, exposure to COVID, probably they had asymptomatic inf infection. Quite a number was still positive for RT-PCR, although majority was negative for RT-PCR. Uh, and during, uh, uh, initially last year, no, when we were just starting on MIS-C cases, we had some confusion on where to place this RT-PCR positive MIS-C cases because before, when your RT-PCR positive, automatically you go to the COVID ward. But we all know that MIS-C is a post-infectious complication, so they are less likely communicable. So what we decided is that if you are RT-PCR positive, you have no respiratory symptoms, and you have an IgG that's positive, you can be placed in the non-COVID ward. But if you are RT-PCR positive with respiratory symptoms, you still go to the COVID ward. Majority have abnormal uh, echocardiographic finding, and, and the most common finding is pericardial effusion and coronary artery dilation. 
around 8% had poor myocardial contractility, and most of these cases were seen in the ICU. When it comes to organ involvement, uh, the most common organs involved were the cardiac, gastrointestinal, and mucocutaneous. Okay, we mentioned earlier that there should be a laboratory evidence of inflammation. And among the laboratory tests that, um, that we requested, it was the interleukin-6, the ESR, and the CRP that, that has the highest sensitivity. Among the cardiac markers, it was the pro-BNP that has the highest sensitivity. Um, we all know that we treat MIS-C by IVIG, steroids, um, aspirin. And as we see here, um, there's almost an equal number of patients who received IVIG and steroids with or without aspirin. Some also receive treatment like antibiotics because differential diagnosis for MIS-C is, is sepsis. Some also received enoxaparin if they had uh, very high D-dimer results. When it comes to outcome, um, luckily, 96% no, were discharge improved. As I've mentioned, we only had two mortalities, and these were the ones who had genetic abnormalities from the start, the one with cocaine syndrome and um, congenital microcephaly. The average hospital stay was six days, and those who, 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 who were admitted more than uh, five days most likely had myocardial dysfunction, warranting um, ICU stay and um, for closer monitoring. So seven patients or 13.7% had significant um, PICO stay. So these were the ones who had uh, myocardial dysfunction, uh, need inotropes and need closer monitoring. There were none, uh, none of those who had missed c were vaccinated with COVID vaccine. So what were the challenges in the diagnosis and management of MIS-C? So positive serologies for SARS-CoV-2 are no longer as informative for a diagnosis of MIS-C given the widespread native infections as well as increasing vaccination. There is no readily available test to differentiate the IgG resulting from COVID vaccine or IgG from a past infection. Um, I think these tests are available in reference laboratories, but in, you know, in regular lab laboratories, even in our hospital, we don't have that. And of course, um, again, it's very difficult and it's really a challenge differentiating MIS-C and Kawasaki disease because they have overlapping clinical manifestations and either, even their laboratory tests are, are similar. They, have, they also have elevated inflammatory markers. So this is an international data on the common features of MIS-C and Kawasaki disease, fever, rash, conjunctivitis, and oral, oral mucosal change. Coronary dil dilatation is seen in both, but is more commonly seen in Kawasaki disease. While cardiac dysfunction, gastrointestinal symptoms, shock or hypotension, is more commonly seen in MIS-C. Third challenge is, again, we, I've already mentioned this, there's no specific diagnostic test that differentiate MIS-C and Kawasaki disease. And although we say that inflammatory markers are higher in MIS-C than in Kawasaki, there's really no cut-off number that says that if you have this number, it's already MIS-C instead of Kawasaki disease. And if you notice on the CDC case definition for MIS-C, there's an addendum that states that some individuals may fulfill full or partial criteria for Kawasaki disease, but should be reported if they meet the case definition for MIS-C. So, um, so if you have some criteria of Kawasaki disease, they will still be uh, reported as MIS-C. And I've mentioned this also, that with relaxed measures, persons with COVID-19 symptoms are not tested anymore unless they are hospitalized. There's also a shortage of uh, serologic tests for COVID-19 recently. 
So for the past two months, even in our hospital, we send out uh, specimens to other labs just to, to avail of the serologic test. And because of the increase in the number of Missy and Kawasaki disease cases, we also have a shortage of IVIG. Um, I would tell the parents that if there's no IVIG, I would just give uh, steroids, but most mothers are hesitant because, because they know of the side effects of, of uh, steroids and they would rather wait for the availability of the IVIG. The only known risk factor we have for MIS-C for now is having an acute COVID infection. So in order to prevent MIS-C, we have to prevent COVID infection. So how do we prevent COVID infection? How do we stop the spread of COVID-19 and the evolution of these variants? So I think we all know this, no? We have to wear masks, um, good ventilation, um, hand hygiene. But I think the most important of them is the one on, the, on your left upper corner, and that is getting vaccinated and boosted, boosted if you are eligible. And this was proven by a study done in 2021 among adolescents 12 to 18 years old, wherein it was observed that COVID-19 vaccination protects against multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children among 12 to 18 years old hospitalized. And the vaccination reduced the likelihood of Miss C by 91%. So COVID vaccination is the best protection against Miss C. And although there are rare case reports that Miss C can also be triggered by the vaccine, um, if you compare the two, the rate of developing Miss C for an unvaccinated person is 200 per million. Comparing that with a vaccinated person, it's only one per million. So this is to tell you that Miss C is a vaccine preventable disease and we should continue to encourage mothers to have their children vaccinated. Thank you very much for your kind attention.